So I am continuing my journey to get through the entirety of the Ghost in the Shell anime, and after re-reviewing the original 1995 film, I am now going into Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence, which is completely new territory for me. I have never seen this movie before until earlier today, and I'm still not exactly sure how to think about it. It definitely seems like the kind of movie that you would get more out of in repeat viewings because there's a lot of imagery and... Uh, quotes from different novels and philosophers and religions and stuff. And there's a lot going on in this movie uh, that I'm sure is ripe with material to talk about. I'm only going to go on based on my only my initial viewing. Uh, so bear with me, and I apologize if I do get some things wrong here. But uh, Ghost in the Shell 2, it is a sequel to the original film, and it is actually directed by the same person, uh, Maru Oshi. I'm sorry if I get that got that wrong, but he directed both Ghost in the Shell movies. And this does sort of pick up after the first one. And it's strange because I've heard some people say that this isn't really a sequel, but it, it seemed to be, and it seemed to be important that it was, especially dealing with the character of Bato. So uh, at the end of the original Ghost in the Shell, after the strange merger, you know, the major, you know, the main character of Ghost in the Shell kind of escapes Section 9 and goes off to do whatever kind of ascended being thing there is to do, and Bato was the only one that knew what happened to her. Well, she's not the main character of this movie, which was strange to me, but also I really liked it because I like when sequels dare to be a little bit different and don't just repeat the same events from the first movie. So the major is not the main character of this film. The main character is Bato. And I thought that was great because I've always loved Bato and I've always wanted to see more of him. And he gets a lot of screen presence here. And I think a lot of the themes of the movie deal heavily with what's going on inside of his head, even though you don't get any kind of explicit statements of it. Uh, Bato and Tagasa. Tagasa was in the first movie too, but it's like, instead of now the Major and Bato being the two partners that are investigating and solving the crime, now it's Bato and Tagasa. So they're still working for Section 9. And Bato is dealing with the loss, I guess. Not not loss as in death, but but kind of. Like he's grieving in a way. He's dealing with the loss of the Major. And not having that person to connect with the way that he did before. And he talks about her from time to time and, and brings her up into conversation. And other members of Section 9 kind of mention, you know, that he's acted a little weird since she's left. And so there's this big, even though the major is not really in the movie. By the way, this is going to be uh, spoiler filled because Ghost in the Shell is one of those things that it's it's like, it's so hard to talk around spoilers when you're dealing with kind of like abstract ideas of AI and everything and what it means to the story. So I apologize, but yeah, I'm going to be delving into spoilers. So if you haven't seen the movie, um, this video is going to spoil it for you. But uh, essentially, there's a new mission at hand, which is different than the original. It doesn't tie back into the story of the first movie or anything. It, this is completely its own story. It's a completely new mission. Um, but the the absence of the major is a very, very important aspect of this movie, especially for Bato as a character. So even though she's not really in it, she kind of shows up at the end a little bit. But, um, you know, she's not the focus, which I thought was incredibly interesting because from what I've always known of Ghost in the Shell, which is pretty much just the 95 movie and standalone complex, you know, she's the main character. So having an entire movie without her was kind of bold and kind of interesting. And so I, I, I dug that aspect of it. But essentially the story gets started because murders are happening where these robots are murdering their owners, but they're not just regular robots. They're sex robots. And I've always said, listen, I deeply distrust AI and I think we are heading towards a robot apocalypse in the future. And I've always said the first robots that are going to attack us are the sex robots. Okay. And yes, that is a joke, but I'm also kind of serious about it because it does make the most sense to me in my brain. But the the fact that they were sex robots, let me, let me just kind of like go from the beginning to the end of the movie. And then I'll tell you what I kind of think about this as an idea. There are sex robots that are turning on their owners and killing them. At the end of the movie, if I understand it correctly, we find out that basically ghosts, you know, kind of like the persona or, you know, the however you want to think about how the ghosts are explained in Ghost in the Shell, you know, the, the soul, the persona, the personality, um, were taken from little girls. 
okay? That makes it even more disturbing and even more creepy. Also goes into, you know, the elements of human trafficking and how that's always kind of been a thing. It's like connected to the Yakuza and stuff like that in the movie, but it's uh, deeply disturbing when you, when they find the little girl at the end of the movie. And, um, essentially one of the guys had all of these robots kind of go rogue in order to, to, to get to a point where they would find them and, and rescue the girls. So all of these murders kind of happened at the expense of maybe doing something very good, um, at the end of it. So it's kind of a, that's kind of a conflicting thing, I guess, for the audience. Like, is, is it worth it? Well, yes, because you're rescuing these girls, but, also, how many people died in the process? Um, you know, so it's kind of like one of those morally conflicting things, which is interesting. Um, the other interesting thing about it being sex robots to me, and I don't necessarily want to claim that this is a statement the movie's making, but when you think about the idea of a sex robot, you know, what what is that really? It's a, it's a replacement for true intimacy, right it's it's getting something synthetic that is either you are incapable of or you just don't want to deal with that kind of real human connection and when you're in the world of ghost in the shell which there's all these augmentations and ai and and all of these things kind of exist already you're already kind of in that world that is causing more detachment um from humanity right and what i find interesting about that is it it, it kind of is this like theme of loneliness, right? And Bato himself does not have a sex robot. He has a dog. He doesn't do anything weird with the dog. <laughs> it's kind of a weird moment to bring that up. But essentially what I'm saying is he's dealing with that kind of um that kind of isolation, that kind of loneliness, right? Like he's dealing with not having the major around to confide in anymore, and I don't think he even realized how much he liked having her around to confide in, right? And as far as I know, I'm not like the biggest Ghost in the Shell fan, so I don't know if there was ever like a romantic inclination between those two characters. For me, watching the first movie, it seemed as though they were just partners and there wasn't, there was just kind of like more of a platonic working relationship. Maybe I'm wrong, but whether or not that's the case, um, you know, even when you're dealing with different genders, like I feel like the ability to confide or the ability to talk to somebody of a of a different sex than you are, you know, is comforting, right? And then having that taken away, now his partner is Tagasa, who's a pretty cool dude, but now you got two dudes on the case as opposed to maybe this dynamic that worked a little bit better for Bato that he didn't really understand why it was so comforting to be able to talk to her. Yeah, so you're dealing with this idea of like, loneliness and, and isolation, which I think plays into why sex bots were kind of the chosen, you know, like, um, method here. And there's, there's this whole long sequence where one of the, um, I, I don't actually even know what she is. She's like one of the workers that Bato and Tagasa go to kind of talk about, you know, the, uh, the destroyed body after Bato shoots down the, the first sex bot that attacks him. And she's talking about how, kids play with dolls and that it's not about the idea of wanting to have children it was like it's like a replacement of you know of intimacy or something or or being able to have something there that you you feel a connection to and i think i don't know how to put it into words but between that like the idea of a child with a do with a doll the idea of bato with his dog the idea of people getting these sex bots. I just feel like there's there's something there that I can't quite put my finger on that is trying to talk about the inability to connect or or the idea that you need to have something there to fill the void of that lack of connection. You know? It's like there has to be something there that you can talk to, that you can, uh, not in a weird way, like put your hands on, like be able, something physical there, you know, that is real or even it's not real, but like something you can touch, something you can, you can reach out and touch um, that exists that you can kind of confide in in some way. And are we capable of even kind of being human if we don't have that? And if we don't have that, in the form of a person, then we we grab these other things 
to kind of fill that void, right? I think I'm getting it. Maybe I'm wrong. The whole sequence that I don't really understand is when they go to investigate um, the character that has put himself into the body of a doll in in the mansion, and he also has a bunch of other dolls. It's almost as if he prefers being that way and living that way. And there's a whole kind of confusing sequence where I guess Tagasa sort of gets hacked inside of his mind, and they're replaying the same incident over and over of them arriving at the mansion. They're kind of trapped in this loop, uh, like a time loop for a little bit. I I don't really understand that part of the movie. That is definitely going to require a rewatch from me. Um, other than just the character kind of like, you know, stating like there's not really much of a difference between, uh, you know, a human body and a doll body. Like, what does it matter if we do this? Like, what makes you human? You're also all assembled from parts and stuff like that, which is kind of just the same general idea of, you know, talking about themes of androids or replicants or something that would be in Ghost in the Shell or Blade Runner, like what is really the difference after all? Does it matter what your your vessel is, you know, your your physical vessel, if everything else is kind of working the same way? Does it matter if you're made out of flesh or does it matter if you're made out of doll parts? What's really the difference? I can understand all that to a degree, but I don't really understand the whole mansion reliving the same moment over and over thing and also with this and some of the cgi in here it's mostly animated the same way as the original but there's a lot of cgi elements and some of them don't really work too well for me and it also makes the movie probably deliberately feel kind of dreamlike like it there's aspects of this movie where you kind of feel like you're in a little bit of a haze and like you're feeling a little bit out of it and maybe that's just to kind of like put you into the same perspective of the characters or maybe that's just how I viewed it when I was trying to watch it but there are particular moments especially that there's like a parade sequence that's all CGI that I didn't really quite grasp and that kind of leads into the whole mansion sequence that I also didn't really quite get but all of that that whole segment of the movie feels super dreamlike and I think that that was intentional. Now, it all leads up to the final action sequence of the movie, which was quite good. I, I like the choreography and I like the action of the ending where Bato has to go down into this like submarine thing and take out all of these sex bots. He's just getting attacked by like an army of sex robots and he just starts mowing them all down. And uh, that's when they discover like the children or well, the one girl, it's one girl that's down there, but you get the idea that they've been doing this for like quite some time. Um, that they managed to rescue her. But when he goes down there, the major shows up and she takes over the body of one of the sex bots to help him during the battle. Because I guess she's just sort of like hacked into everything. She can kind of appear wherever she wants to. She was kind of, she was sending him kind of vague messages throughout the movie. But then I also wonder if this was actually, you know, uh, was this like really happening? You know, was the major actually there helping him or was this kind of Bato? Cause we see that sort of like dreamlike strange repetition thing in the mansion. And there's nothing that says Bato was hacked after that. So I assume that it is, re I'm going with the assumption that yes, the major actually did show up, inhabit one of the bodies to help him out. But I also think that maybe it could be possible that that was part of Bato's kind of, uh, um, need for catharsis, you know, his need for kind of being able to talk to her one last time and, and move on. And like I said, it's not like she, she, her character didn't die. If anything, she kind of ascended to like another stage of life. But like, um, for Bato, you know, getting that closure was probably something he didn't realize he needed when he said goodbye to her at the end of the first movie. And throughout this entire film, it seems like, yes, he desperately needs that. Like, he needs that closure. So this kind of acted as that. But um, regardless, the fight scene was cool. Bato's down there with a big motherfucking gun. He's blasting these sex bots into oblivion. Um, the Major's helping him out, and they do rescue the girl at the end, which, uh, you know, overall is a very good thing. But in order to have that happen to where people caught on that this was happening you know, all of these other murders happened in the process. So it's this sort of ambiguous feeling of like, well, this is a good thing, but there's consequence. And it ends kind of on a joke 
where Bato's holding his dog and then he sees Tug- uh, Tugasa give his daughter a doll or she has a doll and it sort of like calls back to the whole movie like, oh God, she's got a fucking doll. It's kind of like a humorous moment, but it also is a little bit depressing because if we go into that idea that like she has the doll, right? Because, you know, to, to fill that kind of void when probably her dad isn't around and he's on all of these missions, you know, not at home. So it's always an element to have something to to fill that gap, to fill that void of not having that connection that you so deeply desire. And it can be, oh, maybe like the name of the movie, Innocent, like a child with a doll, totally innocent, but then it just continues to perpetuate as you grow older and live through life. And then it gets to a point where it's extremely sad and tragic, like owning a sex robot that will kill you. I don't know. Like I said, I only saw the movie today for the first time. And I'm sure that this is the kind of movie that on repeat viewings, I would get more out of it and probably understand it better. I'm sure there's lines of dialogue that went over my head. I'm sure there's themes and ideas that I have no idea what the movie is trying to say. I'm just going to give, I'm just giving you guys my first initial thoughts and opinions. Uh, But overall, I actually really liked it, and I wasn't sure how a sequel to the original Ghost in the Shell would play, but because they did a completely different type of story, because they had a completely different main character, I mean, I know Bato's in the first movie, but, like, he is the main character of this one, I I thought that was a creative idea, and I liked liked the way that they did it, and for the most part, I thought the animation was really good, the CGI stuff throws me off. But other than that, I thought the animation was really well done. Um, And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to watch it again. I'm surprised I never watched it till now. But that's the point of this whole review series is so that I can experience Ghost in the Shell really for the first time. So next in order, because I'm going in release order, apparently, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm stepping into a completely different continuity with Standalone Complex. Now, I have technically seen Standalone Complex before, but I watched it when it was airing on Adult Swim, and when was that? Like, back in 2008 or 9 or some shit at this point? Like, it's been a long time. I remember certain pieces and elements and and things that happen, but I don't remember the story in its entirety, so I'm going to be getting into that. With reviewing a TV series as opposed to a movie, obviously it's going to take me longer to get through the episodes, I'm thinking about doing a review for Season 1, and season two, uh, two separate reviews since there's two seasons of it. But maybe if there's a lot to talk about, I'll review episodes in chunks, like maybe five episodes at a time, 10 episodes at a time. I really don't know. And the only way I'm going to find out is when I start rewatching Standalone Complex so I can figure out what would be the best way to review it. But that is going to be next on the chopping block. Anyways, guys, if you like this review of Ghost in the Shell 2 Innocence, let me know down below all your thoughts, theories, comments. And uh, definitely, if you're a big Ghost in the Shell fan, please feel free to say, Ryan, you are completely fucking wrong and off base. This is what the movie actually is supposed to be saying. Um, I'm curious about it. I'm curious about what other people have to say about it, but that's kind of where I'm at right now. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. I appreciate it. Give the video a thumbs up and a comment if you liked it. And if you want to support the channel on a deeper level, I do have Patreon, channel memberships, merch store, and all the various social media links where you can follow me down below. Other than that, guys, we have a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll talk to you next time.